This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 535, recorded on February 15th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's uh, it's overcast and a little drizzly today, and um, we have a lovely glaze of ice over top of a few inches of snow outside that arrived a few days ago. Wow. Yeah, we have sun here. It's quite a nice day. Oh. It's, uh, It's a few degrees above freezing. 12 degrees Celsius. Positively balmy. Yeah. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. It's great to be here. Uh, We have the same sun, and I would call it a little bit more than slightly above freezing, Uh, but it's 13 here. Um, I'm very happy with it. Yeah. (laughs) And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Get a load of this. It's <laughs> no. 84 oh. degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, you're in <laughs> shorts, about, right? You're in about, shorts. I am. And I'm sitting in my uh, my home office with the window open for the first time in a while. Actually, it's getting warm in here because it's in the front of the house. That's uh, 28 C and 302 Kelvin for anybody <laughs> who's uh, keeping track. And it's um, mostly sunny. So we got another cold front coming through, uh, but uh, spring is here. I mean, it's not going to get colder. It's not going to get below uh, 40 with highs in the f- mm, 60s during the day. So I think we're done with winter. Is Harper, still, is Harper still there? No, Harper's gone. She left. Harper, uh, Harper left. Okay. I can't believe your winter's over. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, what they There's call a, winter. Yeah, what they call winter. <laughs> yeah. It, actually, it's more of a winter than we used to get in uh, Gainesville. I'm still adjusting to this. I mean, stuff actually dies. Uh, and in our garden, you know, it's we're down to garden beds and that kind of stuff. And you kind of genuinely start over in spring. It's a lot more, it's a lot more uh, uh, subtle in Florida. One of the first signs of spring here in Texas is the red buds. And I have a red bud out back. It's a tree that buds red during the during mm-hmm. spring, and it's got little buds on it. It's about ready to go. A few announcements before we get started with virology. European Congress of Virology 2019 abstracts are due March 1st, two weeks or so from now. ECV2019.com. And in connection with that meeting, Ben and Rebecca wrote, Hi, Twiv. Me and Rebecca are two first-year PhD students working on Ebola, and we are huge TWIV fans. We would absolutely love to be in the audience for TWIV in Rotterdam. How would we go about applying for this? Thanks a lot, Ben. <laughs> I think it's funny. You have to, you have well, there's, to a, there's a 15-page form downloadable <laughs> on, a, on a website we can give you a link to. You'll have to have that notarized. Um, <laughs> you think, need four rec letters. <laughs> yes. And then, then there's the fingerprinting. So we are currently Not, working out the no. details. Um I'm doing two TWIVs, and I, I spoke to the organizers this week, and they said we could give you a huge room or a small room of what fits 150 people. And I said, let's do a small room. And they said, okay, then we will give preference to PhD students. So that's what we'll do. We will, you know, let PhD students in first. But I, I think that not going to. And it sounds like rooms. Ben and Rebecca are PhD students, so they're yep. they're shoe ins for this. Um. So, Ben and Rebecca and any others who are going and want to hear TWIV, I will let you know in the coming weeks what the arrangement is. We'll, we'll sort something out so that you can – maybe we'll make a TWIV ticket like we had in Austin. Actually, that was Texas A&M where we had the TWIV ticket. Yeah, that's right. Also joining us right here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. It's uh, nice out, isn't it? It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, not for long, but it's gorgeous. Right, right you're going to have a storm? No, it's, it's just going to get cold, that's all. All right, so that's the um, European Congress of Virology. Don't forget the ASM Clinical Virology Symposium, May 5th through 8th. That's in Savannah, Georgia. You can submit your abstract until March 8th at asm.org slash cvs. Intel Science and Engineering Fair is uh, is needing some judges. 
in 22 scientific and engineering disciplines. And you can go to a link, which will be in the show notes, to find out more and register to be a Grand Awards judge. And I should say, the other meetings we're going to be going to this year include ASV in Minneapolis and ASM in San Francisco. ASM is in June. Yes. And uh, in, in, uh, we'll be doing a TWIV and a TWIM there. And the TWIM will be number 200. Oh, Which took well, 20 years to cool. get to. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. All right. We have some follow-up. Alan, can you take that follow-up? Sure. Ronnie writes, Dear TWIV team, thank you for covering our paper about M6A regulation of type 1 interferons in your latest TWIV episode 534. We wanted to clarify some of the points that were brought up in your discussion. Uh, our work started with the observation that human cytomegalovirus infection induces the expression of M6A machinery. While we still don't know what is the exact factor that drives this upregulation, we know that infection with UV inactivated virus does not induce the expression of the M6A machinery, shown in Ian Morris' paper and our unpublished data. This implies that the induction is driven by a viral gene or genes that are actively transcribed following infection. As you discussed, we show that depletion of M6A machinery leads to increased interferon transcript stability and an increase in interferon-stimulated gene expression. However, this happens also following treatments that do not induce the M6A machinery, infection with a UV-inactivated virus or an Ian Morris study by transvection of double-stranded DNA. This means that the regulation of interferon transcript by its methylation occurs regardless of the upregulation of the M6A machinery, and it's therefore an intrinsic property of interferon, probably designated to, probably to limit the duration of the antiviral response. Furthermore, the benefits of the induction of M6A writers and readers for the virus are yet to be completely understood. The available M6A mapping methods are not quantitative, <clears throat> so we still don't know how this upregulation of the M6A machinery affects the stoichiometry and um, combination of interferon transcript methylation and whether this further enhances the destabilization of interferon transcripts. Although our results show that the increased interferon response in cells depleted of M6A machinery is the main reason for the inhibition and viral propagation in these cells, the induction of M6A machinery could possibly serve the virus in additional ways. I hope this clarified some issues. It did. It did. Yes, it did. I do like that. More and more, we're seeing the authors of papers we discuss right into TWIV. Yes, yeah, that's good. Now, it's good in a way, but... I hope that we're not losing our non-scientist audience. Ah. Are yeah, you still was, out there? That, 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 letter <laughs> that letter clarified some things for those of us who were closely following all the aspects of that study. It may not have clarified things for casual listeners who yeah. just kind of, kind of got the general gist of it. But these are, these are details that are of interest of, uh, for furthering the study. The uh, induction uh, in, the, uh, um, in the presence of uh, UV inactivated virus well, first of all, the, the machinery, uh, they don't know what drives it, and it doesn't get induced with UV inactivated virus. So that's very interesting. The other part is the methylation is still happens with UV uh, inactivated virus, the methylation of interferon message. So that right. they think is a property of the interferon system, which is mm -hmm. cool. Hmm. Very like the interferon system is normally methylating this to be able to tamp itself down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Got to keep from damaging yourself. Yes. Dixon, can you read everything there? Do you see? I do. Can, I can. you read uh, Trudy's letter? I knew you'd have me read this one. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Trudy writes, Dear Twivers, Brisbane is located on the east coast of Australia, right in the middle, or at the country's equator. To address Dixon's comment, while it is most definitely below Cairns, it is not anywhere near Cairns. <clears throat> It actually takes almost 20 hours to get from Brisbane to Cairn by car. It takes about that long to get from any one major city to the other in Australia. I lived in Brisbane for five years and made it to Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, and, on, and Adelaide, but unfortunately not to Cairns. I have attached a map for context. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trudy. <laughs> I mentioned Cairns as a point because I, yeah. it's the only place I know up in the northeast there. It's way up in the northeast. But it's way, it's up. way up. It's a big country. <clears throat> it's very long. Yeah, it is yes, a big it country. is. And they don't have a lot of people there. <clears throat> you know, 23 million. Wow. 
very large, almost entirely empty place with Correct. cities scattered around the coast. It's, it's nature's largest solar panel waiting to get used. <laughs> Much of it is uh, inhospitable, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's full of venomous animals. And, that's right. Yeah. And that's, and the, way it should, that's the way it should stay. And rabbits. <laughs> and rabbits. Yes. Yeah. That's and, right. That's right. Uh, right. Venomous animals and invasive uh, species. There you go. <laughs> That's a good title, Venomous Animals. Venomous Innovation. Animals. But invasive we don't have species, uh, don't, anything not, not today. to do with it today, not unfortunately. Today. Right, right. Venomous have, Animals, Invasive Species, and Myxoma. We do have Dixon. <laughs> yeah. Are you are you venomous and invasive? No. No. Not, not even a little. All right. So we have a paper that was suggested by Alan Dove. Yes. And, you know, Alan doesn't suggest too often, so when he does, I just automatically jump, jump on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. Right. How high? <laughs> Real-time dissection of dynamic uncoding of individual influenza viruses by Chin Li, Li, Yin, Zhang, 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 and Kui. Wow, how about that? That was a bunch of different authors. That was not one person. Yeah, it was one, yeah, two, Chong, three, Chong four, Chin five, is six, the seven, is the first author, <laughs> only first author. There are two Li's, a Yin, three Zhang's, and then Zhang Qiang. Zhang, Zhang Chang Kui is the senior author. Wuhan Institute of Virology, University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Hmm. So this uh, this work is out of China, folks. Yes. <laughs> and um, the, what caught Alan's eye were the quantum dots used yes. in this work. And I don't know if, do you remember discussing quantum not, dots previously on TWIV? Alan, you I, were here. This I think. sounds Familiar Twiv one seventy five was I was on that show right I believe so yes Twiv one seventy five uh, more than one way to skin a virus you must have been on the show yeah. yes I think oh I was look on at that this show. me you and Matt Freeman oh yes that was HSV and uh, microneedle based influenza skin immunization yeah I don't know where the quantum dots came in but quantum dots are basically little LEDs is that right kind well, of really yeah, yeah. they're little <clears throat> They're, they're little uh, nanoparticles of semiconductor compounds. Really um, little. So th mm -hmm. the yep. same stuff, same kinds of materials you would make computer chips out of, but they're really, really little, and they have, as a result, they're kind of between being chips and being atoms. Mm -hmm. So they, mm -hmm. they have these almost atom-like properties, and they're really, really small, you know, a few nanometers across, um, which in this case means that they can be stuffed into a viral particle without a, doing a whole lot of damage. Um, mm. And they mm -hmm. can, Amazing. they fluoresce. You can mm -hmm. make them, since these are, these are man-made things, you can design them, these nanoparticles, to emit light at different wavelengths when they're, when they're excited by, uh, by a laser or something. And on, when we did that TWIV, the following episode, we got a letter from someone who talk, told us about all the other applications of quantum dots, which I think include TVs, right? They make sure. TVs out of them. Yes. Uh, they are used quite a bit in um, multicolor flow cytometry mm. um, as right. uh, dyes for your, you know, 16, 20 color cytometer. Mm. Um, so I use them a bunch as a graduate student. Which gives too much data that I can comprehend. <laughs> Correct. More data than I can comprehend. I will now put a 20-dimensional graph on the screen for two <laughs> yes, minutes. Exactly. And yes. spend 10 seconds explaining it yes. and move on, and I don't, no, have no time. Pay no attention to the 90%. <laughs> I want you to look down at the bottom left. Yes. <laughs> Quantum dots, QDs. So they have incorporated them into influenza virus particles to study uptake and uncoding of the particle and import into the nucleus. It's pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah. So by, by, cool. Uh, by... Really small. We're talking nanometers, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah they're so smaller that's than what, a virus that's, particle. Yes, you could, looks like you could get, uh, you know, easily a hundred or two or three hundred of these inside an influenza virus particle. Yeah, they have EMs so of them. You can see yeah, them. So inside. they're so they're really small. They're different colors, and um, uh, so a, 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 a nanometer. What's that? Like one billionth of a meter? Yep. Yeah. I got yeah, that right. The ninth. That's right. Yep. That's but they, but they say they can only get one or two or three in. They can't get eight in a particle. They're working on it, but they can't get eight in. Eight That's just a packaging because thing. That would, that would potentially get you one on each uh, segment of the ribonuclear protein. Yeah. Right. The way they do it is very clever. Um, they start by um, <laughs> fusing. So you, you, better, you better review 
What the do you flu want? genome. Flu is a, a negative sense RNA virus enveloped, uh, and it has its RNA genome broken up into eight segments. Right. And it is and, an envelope these, virus, and these eight segments are all essential. And the eight segments are encased in proteins, so they, they are referred to as ribonucleoproteins, RNPs. And those are then stuffed inside the viral capsid, which is inside the envelope. And the question is, how do these get these? Uh, this virus, the genome, uh, does a lot of its replication in the nucleus, which is yes. unusual for an RNA virus, but nevertheless. And so the big question is, how do you get from a virus particle outside the cell to individual and collectively all eight of these segments in the nucleus. And the vaudevillian answer to that question, Richard, is practice. Practice. <laughs> <laughs> the um, entry of this virus has been studied for many years, so we know the virus is, it binds sialic acid receptors. It's taken up into endosomes. As the endosome pH drops, the hemagglutinin undergoes a conformational change that allows fusion of the virus and the endosome membrane. The ribonucleoproteins come out of the particle and they go through the nuclear pores into the nucleus. But as they say here, we've never seen this in real time. We don't really know anything about the timing and the dynamics. So if we can see it, what better than to see something directly than indirectly, which there is you know, most yeah, of the experiments we do. That's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, and they sort of didn't know if the eight segments traveled together or if they traveled separately mm -hmm. right? Um, or did yeah, any in fact, sort there's of some interesting patterns. Some fluorescent, fluorescent labeling stuff that they cite showed uh, suggested that the eight segments travel together and what we're going to see in this paper is that may not be the case so and and uh most of the methods that have been used to study this kind of stuff in the past require uh fixing uh, so that's killing the cells and one of the advantages of the quantum dot uh technology is that you can do it on living cells so they can actually yes. take movies mm -hmm. of this happening yep. So you can do it, do it with living cells and also living virus because a lot of the other entry work has been with, uh, say, micro-injecting the mm -hmm. ribonucleoproteins. So you can actually get these. They, they use a couple of clever little techniques to package up the virus so that it's got a um, couple of quantum dots incorporated into the ribonucleoproteins. Everything's packed up into the virus. It has a, takes a little bit of a hit in growth, but not a whole lot. But you can grow this virus and... It enters cells, and it goes through its whole cycle. Yeah. But they don't show is whether they travel in first or second class. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or economy plus. Or economy plus. <laughs> so the way they get these dots in is cool. They take a biotin acceptor peptide, and they fuse it to one of the viral proteins, the PA protein. And that's a protein associated with the RNA protein segments, right? One, then, one molecule of this protein per segment. Right. And then they, we know that biotin will bind streptavidin. So biotin is then, uh, sorry, biotin is the, is the tag that's put in the protein. Streptavidin is conjugated to the quantum dot. And then huh. it's conjugated to the biotin on the, piggybacking on the viral and piggybacking. protein. Yeah. And the way they do it is cool. They actually put an enzyme in along with the virus to conjugate. <laughs> the biotin to the streptavidin so it doesn't fall off. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. that's how they do it. I was a little sad when I read this part because I was hoping they were going to directly label the nucleic acid. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about all sorts of applications for that. So now oh, I want to read yes. about whether or not <laughs> anybody can actually get the Q dot directly onto the nucleic acid instead of having a viral protein uh, intermediate here. Is there a need so for a signal not? peptide to go through the nuclear pore? You need an import signal. You do. Yeah. You it's need in the viral. NLS. It's in yeah. the capsule. Nuclear localization signal is in one of the viral proteins on the RNP. Got it. It's it on the nuclear protein, I believe. Got it. And then you need an export signal. So nucleic acids to get in the nucleus have to be bound to a protein that has an import signal. And that's why one of the reasons why the flu RNAs have proteins bound to them. Roger but that. going to you, back to you, Brianne, I don't see why you couldn't put the dot right on. Exactly. You can yeah. make biotinylated nucleotides. Right, exactly. Right. And so I, after I read this, I yeah. decided I wanted to go ahead and look at that maybe this weekend. I'll look in the literature. A, ho yeah. a whole bunch of questions come up. Uh, you know, given that the uh, genome is coated with protein, would that uh, uh, 
obscure the biotin on the nucleic acid from binding the quantum dot? My guess would be yes. Oh, that's but a good I don't point. know. It's a good. That's a good question. Mm. And the other thing is that if you incorporated biotin into the genome, you'd have oodles of biotin <laughs> per segment. Okay, so mm-hmm. would you decorate it with a gazillion quantum dots? I don't know. Mm-hmm. A gazillion. A gazillion. Uh, what is that in, in uh, uh, scientific notation? That's a, uh, it's uh, ten Eddie? gazillion. A, a G with a whole bunch of zeros. <laughs> I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a boatload to the tenth. Yeah. Uh, okay. So actually, one of the one of the advantages of this particular thing that we'll get into is that since there's only one of these protein molecules per genome, that if you uh, introduce two different quantum dots, uh, you can and you see two in a virion, you know that they're on different segments. They can't be mm-hmm. on right. the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what you can do here is then you can track the movement of these dots in infected cells uh, by taking lots of pictures, and then there's software that will analyze the movement for you. Now, this is highly... Uh, uh, this is done in a lot of labs for simply taking single particle imaging where you incorporate, say, GFP into a virus particle, it's now so bright that you can see single particles because mm-hmm. of the brightness expands the, you know, I don't know what you would call Photo it. Photo multiplies. I don't know if that's the right word. And coming from you, I don't, I know, not, know even less that it's the right word. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta wear welding goggles to do these experiments. You make, a, you make up <laughs> stuff. I hear that's, what you're saying. That's what your shtick is, Dick. You it's okay. Am, you want to amplify the signal. Ah, you amplify it. it. Yeah, you amplify That's it. called photomultiplication. So, so this is a whole new new area there where people calculate trajectories and there's all kinds of computational stuff mm-hmm. to follow it and look at dynamics and kinetics and so forth. Really remarkable. It has completely revolutionized the study of viruses. So in the quantum dot, can it be in two places at the same time? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's right. Inside and that's out? Right. That's right. <laughs> So you can infect cells with these viruses, uh, and then you take pictures of them. And as they say, you know, we could watch a particle for a long time. <laughs> we track them for a long time. <laughs> I, thought, I highlighted that phrase. It's yes. so funny. We tracked them for a long time. A long time. time. <laughs> I wonder. I mean, they're talking about hours. Yeah. But, you know, you could set up a, a thing where you have a incubator on top of a microscope and it gets its CO2 and its temperature and you can let it sit there for days and do time lapse or whatever it is that you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can do thousands of particles, right? You can photograph thousands so you can get a, an average of what's going on and you can make these interesting diagrams with lines <laughs> going showing you the trajectory. So what did we find here? Um, <laughs> I just love, we recorded 630 individual Trajectories, and they use confocal microscopes to do this. Um, the viruses exhibited a typical three-phase transport. They move slowly in the periphery, then rapidly towards the nucleus, and then slow movement in the perinuclear region. So they're watching the viruses move in by the endocytic pathway. And um, you can see the RNPs come out of the particles as the pH drops in the endosome and the membranes fuse. They have some movies Yes, here you can watch. Next year, I'll put those in my course. It's very cool to have a movie instead of an animation, which is always subject to the artist's interpretation. Get the real thing. So they have a they have a method where they can actually label the the endosome the vesicle that the virus right. is taken up mm-hmm. into, and they can show that those the dot and the endosome travel together. So the virus is in the endosome towards the nucleus, and right. then they right. separate. So that's the endosome dumping the the virus or the virus actually uh, membrane f- uh, fusing with the endosome to dump the. Uh, nucleocapsid outside of the endosome into the cytoplasm. So that's cool. And and in the viruses that are carrying more than one quantum dot, they separate um, the dots go in in their own way. They separate separately. Follow their own. They separate separately. (laughs) They separate from the capsid and the endosome, and they follow their own trajectories through the nucleus, through the uh, cytoplasm toward the nucleus. Now that that actually surprises me because in in the packaging, 
the, there's this there's this longstanding question is that in order to package eight segments, is it done at random or do they come right. together as some sort of a giant uh, particle uh, and get packaged so in an organized fashion? And it's the latter, right? These uh, segments, am I correct that these segments actually interact with each other? Yeah, they do. That's in correct. a fashion mm-hmm. so that you make a, a sort of a, a super particle that's got one of each. Uh, and that really makes the packaging uh, much more efficient. And I'm a little surprised that that same thing doesn't deliver in the same way to the nucleus to get all the segments in together uh, in a in a non-random fashion. But mm-hmm. here are the data. That's it. it yeah. Going in is different from coming out. And by the way, I want to point out that, it, because this will be relevant in our other paper, that a marker, a protein marker for late endosomes is called RAB7 or AB7. You can buy antibodies against it. And there's a marker for early endosomes called RAB5. So you can easily mark early and late endosomes. Hmm. They also use a drug called amantadine, <coughs> which inhibits the acidification of the virion and prevents the RNPs from exiting it. And they can see that they stay, in fact, in the uh, virus particle in the endosome. So it's a nice control using that. They also have a control where they block endosome maturation um, yeah. with ammonium chloride. Um, and that was a pretty nice control as well. Yeah, there's another drug they use. Is that in this paper or the other one? It has a great name. Does anyone remember that? Um, oh. I highlighted it. Uh, it's, it's here. Maybe I'll get to it. It's an, it's another, um, uh, yeah. So uh, then, uh, all right, so they can see the release from late endosomes near the nucleus, and then they can see them moving uh, towards the perinuclear region. And that, Dixon, is the region around the nucleus. Understood. Yeah, Actually yeah, knew they, that. <laughs> they use the very technical terms uh, about the around nucleus region yes. and the other cellular region. <laughs> <The> cellular region. <laughs> and this happens 30 to 90 minutes after infection. So from the time you had the virus, 30 to 90 minutes later, the release at the perinuclear region is occurring. So that's a nice, um, gives you a nice time frame Does. for influenza virus. It's pretty quick. Of course, these are MDCK cells and culture. Who knows what happens in your nose, Dixon? Only Dixon knows. And he's <laughs> not saying. Dixon knows. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, here's an interesting number. Um, what's the percentage of these viruses that seem to, un- I mean, I've just lost the percentage. Is oh, it, a- yeah, it was really high, I um, thought. Uh, it was, it was like low. 40, 40 something. Yeah, I thought yeah, it, was, it uh, depends uh, on your perspective. Por- I thought 40, it was yeah. low. 41.4% did not complete nuclear entry. Um, yeah, it's a lot. 20, yeah, 23 yeah. only got to the uh, around nuclear region without doing stages two and three, and others, uh, 17.9% anchored on the nuclear membrane but failed to enter the nucleus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. A, I mean, it was a high number, a high percentage of failed. And, and these, are, uh, these are percentages for following a single segment. This is why it surprises me that the, that they're, uh, the, the, particle the nuclear right. particle is uh, disaggregating because now if you have to get all eight in and the chances of getting one in are that low to get all eight in it goes down to to really low it seems to me just on well uh, but on the other hand i could see the selective advantage in this if you have a cell that's infected with multiple particles uh yes to so uh, that each the the uh, give you some RNPs, reassortment yeah, the RNPs are released on their own recognizance toward the nucleus, and some of them will get in and some of them won't. But if there's another particle infecting at the same time and some of them get in and some of them don't, right. then okay. hopefully you get the right eight in the nucleus. Now, all of this low efficiency contributes to the high particle to PFU ratio yes. of viruses in general, right? Because not every mm-hmm. virus will make it and infect successfully. And this is one level getting... Out of the, uh, what is the number? Getting out of the um, endosome? Is that what you said that number was? Uh, 41.4, do not complete nuclear entry. Nuclear right. entry. Okay. Do we know, did they say how many get out of the particle? Uh, um, they said 23.5 were only in the cytoplasmic region without doing stages two and three. Right. So it's pretty inefficient. Yeah. But that's 
part of uh, why viruses make so many particles, so because I, not many will work. I yeah. have a question. Mm. What, if, what if only one segment group entered the nucleus? How many viral particles would come out? One segment group? Eight, all eight. What if oh. only one, all eight got into yeah, the that nucleus? That should work. Yeah, of course it should work. Yeah. But how many viral particles does that produce? Uh, how many particles per cell? Yeah. Thousands. So from one, you can have thousands. From yeah. one, yeah. you can have thousands. That's yeah. another title. Okay. That's how it works. From one, that's how viruses work. Okay. Yes. And from so one bacteria, that's you can have not, two, Dixon. Vincent, that's not inefficient. That's why yeah. viruses rule. This is yeah. not inefficient. Yeah. yeah. Did you see the- um, You only need one. Did you see the little rhyme by Paul Beanash on Twitter yesterday? That was great, yes. yes. Do you remember it, Brian? Uh, What was it? Roses are red, violets are blue, you're 8%- Viral. Viral and 11% alu. Yes, 8% virus and 11% alu. And to which I said, I am 100% viral 100% of the time. And someone said, are you alive then? (laughs) Okay. No, but you're infectious. (laughs) Thank you, Dixon. That's a compliment. I think it is. So then they did the two-segment labeling, as Rich said. And you can see um, that these segments uh, have their own lives well they're not alive they have their own initiatives let's they're undertaking say. their own navigation undertaking their own navigation is there a explanation for the speed up just before it gets to the perinuclear region speed up you said it slows down right and then it speeds up and then it slows down why does it uh, speed up don't know don't know not only that but they, they they dissect the actual entry into the nucleus in three stages as well it has a yeah. slow slow phase and a fast phase and when they're going really mm. fast i did a little calculation here when they're going really <laughs> fast they're going one micron per second which is wow. two times 10 to the minus six miles per hour <laughs> that's pretty fast <laughs> wow they're, they're just faster cooking. than a speeding they're viral cooking. particle <laughs> <laughs> that's really so that's the kind of thing they can do they could figure out the speed yeah. able to lo- leap tall histones in a single bound <laughs> very good <laughs> In the nucleus, they distribute randomly with no obvious specific regional preference. That's bizarre. So some are in China, some are in Australia, yeah. some are in the U.S., Brisbane, Europe. Some are Brisbane, Brisbane Cairns, and some are yeah. in Cairns. Yeah, but it takes a long time to get from one to the other. <laughs> 20 hours by but car. But not when you're traveling at 10 to the 6 miles an hour. <laughs> no, that's the whole idea, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so that's mainly it, Yeah. right? Yeah. That's mainly it, and they say... Um, these findings facilitate a better understanding of early stages of the influenza A virus life cycle. They do. I have to say that, you know, 40, 40 years ago, mm. Ari Helenius was one of the first people to start studying virus entry. Mm-hmm. And the tools were so different. It was all indirect. But all of it. When I was you, studying viral entry, the tools were very indirect, too. <laughs> so how many yeah, papers right. did this study replace by simply being able to look? It didn't replace any papers. No, They're I mean, all still there. I, I know that. But if, if this had been done first, how many papers didn't have to be written? Oh, a lot. And that's lot. What I but thought. that's not the way science that's works, not, as yeah. you so know. Another question about the segments once they're inside the nucleus. And you said they randomly locate. Mm-hmm. Do each, does each segment replicate at the exact same rate as all the other seven? Who knows? What that's do you a, mean who knows? Who knows? Nobody's Isn't looked. that another investigator? <laughs> who knows who knows you no, should that's ask what, him that's what <laughs> or, no, that's first base <laughs> no no it's left field um that's a good question they all replicate independently for sure because each remarkable. have a polymerase attached to them it's you know? remarkable so this rnp rna plus four proteins is it's got a polymerase attached to it so it comes in the nucleus with the rna and it begins to churn out mrna it's like eight separate little viruses so little replicons in. anyway yeah Replicons. Some viruses, it. some negative strand viruses have a single strand of RNA. It's not segmented. That would be simpler. What's the function of that, Dixon? Well, to get from one end to the other. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. From three prime to five prime. <laughs> shouldn't ask you questions. Point two mic- so the technology here is cool. Yes. Um, single particle is amazing. And they can really um, get some interesting information about the different parts of the uh, infectious cycle. And... I uh, I think it would be interesting to do with different viruses in different cells. Now, Dixon. I still have another. Let me ask you a question. Uh, it's my turn. Could you do this experiment with poliovirus? Think slowly. 
Very slowly. <laughs> I think as fast as I type, and I type very slowly. Well, picornaviruses. Of which polio is a member. Picorna, yeah. P, that's P-I-C-R-N-A. It's an RNA virus. <laughs> You're just <a> stalling. <laughs> You're stalling. Yes or no? It's... Could you do this experiment with polio with current technology? Sure. No, this is. I would do it. There's no protein attached to the. I would attach a protein. Oh, VPG. VPG. Uh-huh. Oh, good VPG. point. Yeah. But I bet if you put this uh, biotin peptide in. VPG wouldn't VPG, work. You'd, you'd screw it up. Uh, well, don't you don't know, know the answer until you do it. I, I would like to do that experiment. That would be so, interesting. And I have another question well, about first, the. Re- for- First, I'll figure out how to label nucleic acid, yes. and then yeah, that's right. You can so, do yeah, it. but the, you you might be able to. I would try it with VPG, actually. Sure. Yeah, that would be worth. That's an easy experiment. Yeah. Do the do the viral segments for influenza line up according to segment one, segment two, segment three, segment four, segment five? What do you mean line up? When they all attach together after they get back into the nucleus, or they they well, all they, remain separate? They find they form a circular arrangement, uh, parallel. But they're not attached to each. other. No, they're not attached. Oh, no. Okay, fine. They're not attached, All but right. they seem to interact, ah. as as Rich was saying earlier. The capsid is assembled in the cytoplasm rather than the nucleus, or in the nucleus well, rather than the, it has no, to be. In so the, the RNA is made in the nucleus, right? It's exported to the cytoplasm with the proteins, I mean. and to do that, it needs to have a protein attached to it in the nucleus. Okay, the M one. Sure, protein. there's the exit protein. Right, it's an exit protein. Then in the cytosol. Uh, the other proteins are attached to it. And then it goes to the membrane, the plasma membrane, where the glycoproteins have been inserted, it's and an it envelope. buds out. It's an envelope. It's an envelope virus and okay. forms a particle. Okay. And then it flew off. And then it flew at the window. Influenza. 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 That's right. All right, so that's our snippet. Yep. And you can look up quantum dots on, on, the, on the net, and you'll find lots of information. Yeah, and they get used for all kinds of stuff. It, oh, yeah. And, they're, and they're very, the other thing is that they're bright. Did we mention that? They're yes. very bright. Yeah, I said you had to wear your welding goggles to do that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay. You can ask them anything. They know the answer. The, the, our other paper today is, a, is another RNA virus. I tried to mix them up, but I'm not always successful. It's a group of RNA viruses. It's a whole bunch. It's a whole bunch, and, and Dixon will like. <laughs> no, I, I read the paper. Some of his favorite viruses are here, West Nile That's and true. Yellow Fever. I know That's you true. like those, too. I do, actually. And by so the way, this, I think uh, both papers for today are open access. Wonderful. Excellent. That's why I could read it at home. This is uh, from <laughs> Cell. This is from, uh, what is it? Cell 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 Reports. Reports. Mm -hmm. That's their open access. uh, Exactly. um, What's the nasty word I'm looking for? Their open access. It's not not behind a paywall. Their gesture to open access. Open access. (laughs) We will take one journal that makes relatively little money for us and make it open access. (laughs) um, But the rest of our stuff, the other billion journals, we will not make open access. No, we won't. Flavivirus NS1 triggers vi- tissue-specific vascular endothelial dysfunction reflecting disease tropisms out of the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Puerta Guardo, Glasner, Espinosa, Beering, Patana, Ratansiri, Wang, Beatty, and Eva Harris. And Puerta Guardo and, and Glasner are co-first authors. Exactly. And then, um, uh, yeah. If anybody went to ASV in 2017, some of these data were uh, in her talk. Ah. That's two years ago. I know. I have notes, though. <sighs> stuff takes a while. I have a good memory. <laughs> two years ago. Um, 2017. Hmm. All right. So if you want, you could Google uh, Eva Harris and Rack and Yellow, and you'll find an, an interview I did ah, with her a couple of years there. ago. Well, you weren't there. I thought I was there. Was oh, that t- 2017? That was in um, Wisconsin, right? I was there, Vincent. Yes. Yeah, he was there. I was Oh, yeah, that's right. You were there, yeah. No, no, that's right. You were there, yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Who's older than who? I remember you showed up. <laughs> Why did you come? <laughs> uh, because it was there. <laughs> oh, the company sponsored us. That's right. The um, Promega. Yeah. Because it was in Madison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was a wonder- and you hit it off with uh, Paul... Um, uh, I have to remember Dupre? his name. No, the the he's from Wisconsin, a baculovirus guy. Uh, Rich knows him. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paul, Friesen. Paul Friesen. My gosh, my memory is just shot. No, your just brain is full. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> your brain is full. May I leave the yeah, room? Yeah, you were there, Dixon. But anyway, uh, I there's a, the interview. We had this, um, <clears throat> Alan. You remember you went to the BU meeting? Yes, which was supposed to be the opening of the needle, but was right. You know, 
And and that is where she also talked, and I interviewed her there as well. Yeah, so you can find that interview. Um, okay, so this, what did I say? This is about these flavors. This is an amazing protein, this NS1. Yes. It is. Uh, it is a non-structural protein. Uh, it's soluble and, and infected. It's secreted from cells, and it's, it circulates in the blood. It's amazing. Yeah. And it does all kinds of bad. pretty nasty things. Very bad. So flaviviruses are envelope positive sense RNA viruses. Right. I'm positive about that. Could yes. you do the quantum dot experiment with that, Dixon? You know, you keep putting me on the spot like this, like I'm a virologist <laughs> or something. All right, Brianne, could you do the? <laughs> yeah, Brianne, you could come on, biotinylate the RNA, right? Somebody else. No, but we that's a that's a uh, potential. We don't. What we, don't we have know. now is we can do protein. Right, Brianne, could we right. do quantum dot with flaviviruses? Hmm. Yeah. Well, there's no VPG. No VPG, right? Yeah, so I can't. I don't know of a protein that is bound. No, there's no bound protein on the RNA. That's absolutely right. Yeah, you can't okay. do the experiment. Okay, so oh, it would depend on it would depend on attaching the quantum dot directly to the RNA. Yeah, Correct. so we already paper, we already said, did we not which uh, viruses we, we're talking we did, about? We did. But did we talk about what the? Oh, we didn't. No, didn't do no. any of that. So you can do it. Okay, go dengue. Okay, which causes a hemorrhagic fever. It's going to go back to sleep. <laughs> the uh, dengue, which causes a hemorrhagic fever. Zika virus, which uh, the okay. So I'm emphasizing here the pathogenesis because this paper this comes um, up is relevant to <laughs> does come up. the <laughs> kind of the kind of disease manifestations that these viruses cause. Right. And so why. dengue causes kind of a systemic yeah hemorrhagic fever. Zika. And, causes this well what we've been talking about for the past couple of years is the the potential to infect a, a developing fetus and cause birth defects but there's also some neurological stuff going on with zika right which, west which nile causes the, encephalitis west so nile causes encephalitis so and, Jeff, and japanese encephalitis also causes encephalitis japanese yeah. and, and west nile and right. yellow so fever are, notably targets yeah. the liver right St. Louis encephalitis does also. Which is why it's called yellow fever because it exactly. gives people jaundice from targeting exactly. liver exactly. and yellow is uh and Flavi is the yellow in Latin, right? right. Yes, that's correct. So they have. If the, distinct- if the first virus were not yellow fever virus, this would have a different name. Yes. It would. So, yes, it would be so they have flavor. distinctive. The point is they have distinctively different disease pathogenesis yes. manifestations. And yet. Well, they're all the well, same. Structural all protein the same, one all the same family. Is produced by all, all of make them. this S. Well, yeah, they yeah, all make very this one. Yeah, this whole family is- has, has common. It's um, confounding, though, because the symptoms, Rich, if you're right, and this is the cause of it, then why don't they all cause the same disease? Well, we're going to talk about That's that. That's what we're going to talk about. Well, okay, then. So the NS1 right, protein, it's, not, it's yeah. not 100% identical from one to the other species of virus. Uh, um, it varies within the uh, within the, the family. Line up, they all have the NS1. Line up their but genomes, they all look similar. They got the same yeah. kind of genes, and they're all in the same order. and that kind of, They all make an NS1, but they aren't identical. You there might say they have different flavies. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so these viruses, they include, different flavies. they include seven non-structural proteins, including NS1. Wow. And this has many functions other than the one we're going to talk about today. All right. It is, it's important for replication and assembly. Uh, it plays a role in immune evasion. It plays a role in complement evasion. And then it's going to do what we talk about today. protein for all seasons. It's amazing. One might like to think of how it evolved to do all this, it's right? crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And so there has been some evidence that this protein is involved in vascular leakage, you know, these hemorrhagic. What the hell is all that banging, Dixon? Why should I know the answer to that? I'm looking at you. <laughs> these, uh, You're vi- looking at many the of these viruses, least. hemorrhagic fever involves uh, plasma leakage from blood vessels. So there's some evidence that this protein is involved with that. And so that's what they're going to look at here. And get this, this protein, in dengue at least, one to two micrograms per milliliter of serum. That's not a lot. I don't want to be infected with this virus. Yeah, no. no. Have that much protein circulating? Yeah. Just NS1. That's just NS1 right? circulating. And so people have looked for this. People have designed diagnostic tests based on NS1, actually. They're, they're quite good. I know that Eva Harris was... She talked about that in Wisconsin, in hmm. fact. Hmm. All right, so um, what are we doing here? They make NS1 for all these viruses. They make the protein, which in itself is quite a bit of work. 
Yeah. Because if you've ever done this, you start with one and it doesn't work and they come in your office and say, it doesn't work. What do I do? Yeah, right. <laughs> what do we do next? Do, do the second experiment. And you know what my answer Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> do it again. That's Did right. you stir it? Did you stir it? Try, try adding um, ribosomes next time. <laughs> so uh, then they have um, uh, monolayers of endothelial cells from different tissues, right? And and they going to look at the electrical resistance of these monolayers. So these the transendothelial electrical resistance. Right. Aspect. So these are polarized endothelial cell layers, right? Right. Yep. Polarized. Now, you better explain that. You know, capillaries have one cell layer in them. They do. Yep. It's amazing. Yep. And they're polarized. Right. So polarized means the cells have an orientation. There's a top and a bottom. Kind of like the U.S. <laughs> well, they have a different functional. <laughs> We're polarized. Type like the U.S., that's true. So can we measure electrical resistance? We could. Electoral so resistance. So these include lung. So you can make these from different tissues, right? Mm-hmm. Like right. lung and skin, umbilical vein, brain, epithelial. liver. Epithelial. So I have a, I have a little uh, uh, point of, I have a point of pedantry here. Okay. Pedantry? Pedantry, sure. more or less. Go ahead. Um, Kathy's not here. You might as well. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. (laughs) Uh, They talk about these as primary cells, pulmonary, brain, umbilical, skin, lung. Mm -hmm. Formally, a primary cell is you take cells from a tissue and you stick it in a dish and that's that's it. That's a primary cell. The minute you passage those and uh, uh, dissociate from, from the dish and stick dilute them and stick them in another dish, they are no longer primary cells. And you can do that for a limited period of time, and the cells have a little clock in them, and after about 30 or 40 passages, uh, they die unless they become immortalized, which involves a genetic change, and then they continue on forever. Right. So in this paper, when they they say primary cells, what they mean is non-immortalized. Exactly. They're talking about cells that are within... Oh, uh, between five and 20 passages of primary. Mm. They are not formally primary cells. They're more like diploid cell strains. Okay. But um, it's enough for their studies, though. Yes. It's enough for their studies. I'm, uh, I always. And find importantly, it- they, they, during that time, the, the disadvantage of an immortalized cell line, the advantage, of course, is you can passage it indefinitely. The disadvantage is it's a little bit further from reality. Right. But it's even essentially in a, a tumor cell line. So even this in a is, passage for two or two from primary, there's uh, some some changes. Yes. But it's not there as is, bad There as are some problem. changes, but it's not as radical as turning something into a HeLa cell line, for example. Um, so in this case, they're dealing with lung cells that still are pretty much like lung endothelial cells, and they're in a layer, and they're able to, to look at permeability of them. And I'm sure that there have been a number of different assays performed on these cells that uh, convince investigators that they retain some of the properties of the original yes. tissues. So these originally came from tissues, mm-hmm. from, right. from uh, capillaries, right? Mm-hmm. So where do they get the brain uh, endothelial cells from? A uh, jar named Abby Normal. <laughs> I mean, is exactly. this like is this like a autopsy specimen uh, I, or what? Uh, I think so. I let you because uh, I, I looked in the methods and they say they were a gift of so and so. They could be surgically. They could, have, <laughs> they could have been surgically removed from some kind of brain vascular mm-hmm. surgery. That's, right. That's true. Okay. So yeah. they're not uh, the the disadvantage with an autopsy is it often happens hours after the death, and I don't know what condition of the cells you're getting, but it's it could be autopsy, it could be surgery, was what I was thinking. Yeah, you don't need a yeah. lot. Right. And Dixon, you just volunteered yours? Sure. All right. There's nothing left, but they can have what's left. So we have monolayers, and <laughs> they have a certain electrical resistance. And, the, and if you put the protein on, they're going to measure any changes, which would be a, a measure of disruption of the tight junctions in the endothelial right. cells, right? Right. So, or the glycocalyx, as it's called. The who? The glycocalyx. You heard me, <laughs> mister. Yesterday, we were at a textbook meeting, and I said the word cuckoo, and they all laughed at me. They said, it's cuckoo. Yeah. It's not a word I say often, so I don't know how to pronounce it properly. Ah, okay. Do you you say cuckoo all the time? I say cuckoo. Cuckoo. When I have to use it, I do say cuckoo. (laughs) I say cuckoo. All right. Same as uh, glycocalyx. So you put these, the NS1s, and the amount they added is sort of roughly equivalent to the concentration that's circulating in patients, right? right. Mm Mm-hmm physiologically relevant quotes, right. right? And what they find is that these proteins trigger permeability 
in these endothelial cells, and they seem to correlate with the tropism of each disease. Right. That's amazing. Right? Yes. So dengue does all of them. Zika hits the placental and brain. It, well, they didn't have placenta, but they had umbilical, oh, umbilical vein. vein. Yeah, they yeah. have umbilical vein. And brain endothelial cells. The West, West Nile brain. and Japanese hit the brain endothelial cells. And then yellow fever. Hits the liver. Um, hits it's the, the liver. liver ones. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that's sort of interesting to me <laughs> is that if you look at the, the umbilical cord, um, it looks like dengue is also hitting the umbilical cord and is leading to permeability right. there, um, which is not a pathology that I'm very aware of with dengue. Yeah, and they say later in the discussion that some, they have found dengue in some placentas, I think, in the in the, in the absence of disease, but it's been found on numerous occasions. And they say it's also been found in the brain, again, in the absence of overt encephalitis. So but maybe it, it can get in. It doesn't cross the placenta yeah. into the fetus? Yeah, well, they think it does in some yeah, cases. I, yeah, I mean, dengue in this figure is inducing permeability in all of the tissues that they test. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And they can see, they do, they measure the binding of the protein to cells by fluorescence, immunofluorescence in Western blood assays. And the binding correlates with the um, in, induction of the change of the resistance of the monolayer. By right? the way, page layout nitpick here. I really hate it when the figure <laughs> is on one page and the legend is on another oh, page. I actually had thing. to print figure two so that I could... The, the other thing is they they labeled their cell lines by their sort of official abbreviation. So HPMEC cells, HPMEC1 cell, or HMEC1 cells and so forth. And then you have to scroll down to the next darn page to get to the legend where they tell you HPMEC is lung, HMEC1 is sick in. So I, I had to print out and annotate my own figure in order to work my way through this. So wow. readers at home don't feel bad if you do I have two post-it notes stuck to my uh, screen. Yeah, there you with go. With that same annotation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Does this data suggest that the glycocalyx varies from tissue to tissue or that the protein NS1 varies from... Yes. Both. I think both. The protein has to have some way to interact. It has to be interacting differently depending on what virus it came from. So there's there are differences in... There have to be differences in the tissue that the viral protein is somehow responding to, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is, or the... Uh, End result is that does this allow the virus to diffuse different well, viruses that's the idea. attack that's the idea. different organs? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a lovely example of how uh, pathology is accidental. Yes. Yeah, right. I've been thinking that all the way through. Yep. I, I thought about it as I passed through the toll booth on the turnpike this morning. <laughs> <laughs> that another victim. you know I have just thought in the last ten years about how it doesn't make a lot of sense for viruses to cause disease unless it's a consequence of something else and here the the point is to make the junctions disrupted presumably so the virus has access to tissues right right although we don't know that but that's a reasonable that's a human logical yes. assumption right. and then of course if you disrupt these barriers you're going to get plasma leakage and you get pathologies right. Yeah. So. right right but it's too bad you can't knock it out and see what the difference is because you said it has so many other yeah that's functions. Yeah. too many yeah. you can't get a good answer yeah i mean we can imagine that this is a mechanism for dissemination but we don't officially we can't officially and prove that since these so are how all could you prove since that? these are all vector-borne viruses there's not a whole lot of downside to incapacitating your host as long as you don't kill them before you get into the next vector. Right. Exactly. Yeah, but viruses are not logical. No, they're not logical, way, right? but in terms of the evolutionary pressure on them. The ones that couldn't do that them, didn't survive. Right. The evolutionary pressure on these find a new host. would be find to, a new host. to find a new host and to um, replicate to as high a level as possible while not killing the host before you've gotten your, your next ride. So and since these are vector born, the key is a high viremia. Yes. So right. that a mosquito will pick you up. Right. That's right. And, and so, it doesn't matter if your host is lying there unable to move. In fact, that's kind of an advantage because then they're going to get bitten by more mosquitoes. And if you've gotten to a high titer in the bloodstream and you've permeabilized the barriers that are going to get you that kind of replication, um, then you're more likely to spread to the next host. Right, but exactly. in itself, pathogenesis. No, the path the virus. Logic. No, the virus is not benefiting from the pathogenesis. Yeah. That's incidental to what the virus is doing. Side effect. Right. Yeah. Exactly. 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 I, I think a lot of people have this idea that viruses are after them. No, 
but they're not. They just need a place to replicate. No, we're on. yeah. They they don't so care about they, us in that in that Dixon, sense. Dixon, your question. Um, now they do an experiment looking at NS1. They have this short amino acid sequence of NS1 from amino acids 101 to 135, which they call the wing domain. And um, this this is seems to be important uh, for a number of functions. And they they take a dengue. Um, NS1 and substitute that portion from West Nile. Ah, good idea. Now, a bit of pedantry here, since Rich was able to do this. They call <laughs> this a chimeric mutant. Uh-oh. Okay, you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. <laughs> right. You can have a mutant or a chimera. Come on. <laughs> right. It's like over and you know, out. I said yeah. that in 2017, it wouldn't have come out in this paper. All right, so then they ask, what does this chimeric NS1. That would be okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it? Yeah, what, what kind not, of uh, endothelial what pattern? Cells? What pattern? Yeah, and and they find that it changes the pattern to be more like West Nile. How interesting! So a short amino acid sequence, the wing data, the, the wing, wing, domain. wing domain. And I can't help but, whenever I see the word wing, think of little wing. And I don't think this group here will know what I'm talking about, yeah. but someone, one of our listeners, will. Okay. 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 What's next? Oh, so Rab5 pops its head here again. That's why I wanted you to know about Rab5 in the <laughs> previous paper. An old endosome? Rab5 is an early endosome. In? Rab7 oh, is early. late. Right, sorry. And they can they actually do immunostaining and see that NS1 co-localizes with Rab5. So it's getting internalized into cells. It's not only binding, but it's being taken up into these uh, into endothelial cells. It's quite interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there's a there's a somehow they make a correlation between internalization and uh, activity because there was one example I can't pick yeah, it out right yeah. now whether there was some binding but not good internalization okay but the, it, yeah mm-hmm. so the the differential uh, co- binding patterns correlate with endothelial leakage except for yellow fever okay so binding right. is not enough you need something else and that's why they look at it uptake and they see that these proteins are actually taken up into cells. So what they find is that uh, yellow fever NS1 is bound, but it's not internalized. But, well, that's their hypothesis, and that's what they, uh, in fact, find that dengue NS1 gets internalized and yellow fever NS1 does not. So maybe that's why it doesn't have the effect in many of these cells. Hmm. So that's one set of experiments. The other is, what does this do to the surface of the the glycocalyx, as you right. put it, <laughs> of the endothelial cells? Right? So the glycocalyx is a, a a bunch of branched polysaccharides that form a, a a physical barrier, really a layer on one surface the of the cells, which would which would correlate with the internal surface of a of a blood vessel. Uh, and mm-hmm. so, uh, pres- that is part of what may, of what limits the permeability of these things. So if you mess around with that, uh, layer, that would contribute to the permeability. That's a calyx. Yeah. Calyx. Calyx, calyx is the, is it's it's like the a, structure underneath a flower, um, yeah. under the petals. That's right. So this is after that glyco. It's a, this calyx. is a sugar calyx. This is a, a decorated mm-hmm. Uh, sort of uh, set of sugars that are that are on the surface of the cell, and so then that forms this barrier. Okay, so um, sweet, yes. They <laughs> they add their NS one. <laughs> they add their NS ones and look at the integrity of the various components of the glycocalyx, which includes sialic acid, heparin sulfate, syndican one, which sounds like a Cosa Nostra thing. <laughs> hey. Oh, that's syndicate. Syndicate, yeah. yes. Um, and so dengue NS1 disrupts sialic acid on all of them. And mm-hmm. Zika NS1 disrupts sialic acid on uh, the umbilicus in the brain, etc. You get the picture. It's kind of correlating with the permeability induction. Yeah. It's disrupting. Why is Japanese B encephalitis so much more pathogenic, though, than, say, West Nile? This- I mean, what if you substitute? Are you asking a why question? I'm asking. <laughs> you, you would like what, what is the mechanism that makes it so much more pathogenic? Uh, thank you, Alan. If you flipped this small segment from NS1 from Japanese B encephalitis to West Nile and vice versa, mm, and where would you would put you, it? Where would you put that chimeric virus? Uh, in all of the tissues that both of them were measured in, and see if you could reverse the effect. Yeah, that would 
you could do that. That that's a reasonable experiment. Yeah, I agree. All right, so basically they find that a lot of these uh, glycocalyx components are altered in a manner consistent with their effect on permeability. Mm-hmm. Is that a fair summary? That's uh, a fair statement. Summary? I think so. Yep. And uh, there's, lots, there's a lot of subtlety here, but I don't think we need to go into it. Oh, one thing that's interesting is um, <laughs> these the, the NS1 induces um, sialidases. They actually upregulate various sialidases that remove huh. sialic acids, right? Yep. Right. So that's part of the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> it's pretty sophisticated, right? So you can imagine at some point knowing this whole pattern, the whole sequence of events that occurs after NS1 binding, how it changes the permeability of these things. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, what else? And murine a model. Here we go. Yes, now we go to the mice. Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> so you can, um, you, you have mouse models of, of vascular leakage. And, and this is a lovely assay called the Miles assay. <laughs> Miles to go before I leak. Yes. <laughs> Do you know that's a poem by Robert Frost? Yes. Miles to go before, before I, I sleep. sleep. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Do you remember, Dixon? I, you kind of look like Robert Frost. Do I? I would so be you honored can, to look they, like they first. first do intradermal inoculation with the NS1 proteins, and then they give the mice fluorescently labeled dextran intravenously. Mm-hmm. And then you can watch the fluorescence leaking into the dermis, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't that cool? So that's, a, right. that's, a, that's a Miles assay. And dengue NS1, but not Zika, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, or yellow fever, cause an increase in leakage in the skin. Mm-hmm. And that's... So that's skin intradermal. So then they want to see about organs. They give mice ten milligrams per kilogram of NS1. Roughly what they uh, to to achieve a uh, a concentration in the blood that would be similar to a uh, an infection. Humans, yeah, mm-hmm. right. And then after inoculation, they give them um, again a fluorescent labeled dextran, and you can then say in the tissues. Can you see some fluorescence here? And so for dengue, you get um, hmm. lungs and liver. And brain. Brain too. Yeah. Huh. Dengue does everything. Okay. Yeah. Brain and lung. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Zika, West Nile, brain. Right. In the lungs, dengue, yep. And what's, yes, yellow fever, no leakage in the lung. Zika, no leakage in the lung. Yellow fever is and in so, uh, And so, again, you get a pattern kind of consistent with mm-hmm. tropism of, le- of leakage. So this is good because we've moved beyond the monolayers and we're an actual animal. So your your Japanese experiment, Japanese encephalitis virus experiment, maybe you could do in a mouse model. That would be interesting, right. too. I have to say I'm a little surprised by this because, you know, mice lie after all. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the fact that it's uh, so apparently so well matched. Uh, to both the cell culture and the and the uh, pathogenesis of the disease, I you know maybe maybe it all makes sense. I mean, it does all make sense, but I'm a little surprised that it holds up in the mouse. So th- basically, all these NS1 proteins differentially induce vascular leakage in particular organs that correlate with the pathogenesis. So that suggests that a lot of the disease we see is is a consequence of uh, NS1. Maybe permeabilizing so virus can get through, as we said earlier. Right? I guess. I guess one of the things this means is kind of going back to what Dixon was uh, talking about is that the fundamental properties that distinguish uh, the lining, the, this barrier in the different tissues and the mechanisms for maintaining those barriers that distinguish one tissue from another are very mm-hmm. fundamental and are conserved in humans and mice and probably a lot of other species as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. So here's where um, they talk about dengue. Dengue and yellow fever infections are characterized by systemic disease, vasculopathy, plasma leakage from blood vessels. However, there are multiple reports describing dengue-associated neurological complications like encephalitis and infection of the human brain in autopsies as well as detection of viral antigens in placental tissues from dengue-infected mothers. So they say dengue may get into the brain and cross the placenta. 
but we don't know of any disease associated right. with that as far as I know, right? Yeah, I don't I don't know of any either. But you know, mumps in half of the kids who used to get mumps before vaccination, they had virus in the brain but no symptoms. This is not on that subject, but it's on vaccinations. The recent story about the kid from an anti-vaxxer family decides to get vaccinated. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I heard. That's cool. That's going to happen a well, lot, by the way. Uh, yesterday, there was a report on CNN. The wife of the White House communications director is making anti-vaccine statements. Lovely. And she said all of her friends who have done well in life did not get MMR vaccine. <sighs> they all got measles. So we should let kids get measles. What? You should design clinical trials. Yeah. What? So I think, isn't it time we started thinking about suing these people for I think serious so. denial? This is misinformation from the worst source. Ridiculous. It's horrible. There's a, uh, there's a, there's a summary figure in this, and it is open yes, access. Nice? Yes. It says, when, I, when I looked at it before I read the paper, I've learned to look at, scan the figures and look for a summary figure, among other things. Uh, when I looked at it before I read the paper, it wasn't making a lot of sense to me. But after I read the paper, and hopefully after you listen to the podcast, you can look at this summary figure and it actually encapsulates everything quite nicely. Yes. Yeah, one of the aspects we didn't touch on is when these NS1s are binding the glycocalyx, they're upregulating a variety of enzymes, cathepsins and heparinases that degrade the sialic acid and the G8, the, the glycosaminoglycans, and that helps to loosen up the glycocalyx and... And then you get permeability of the cell junctions and maybe the virus can get in. Exactly. That's really cool. Now, they say here there are two parts of this, Dixon. There's the NS1 side and there's the host side. Indeed. (laughs) And then they say the following. I always like it when when people write like this. Um, where Where is that? I'll find it. Hang on, everyone. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. I, I can't find it, but they say the, vasc- the the vascular endothelium is very complicated. Yes. <laughs> so it's going to be hard to figure out what's going on here. I don't know where it is. They were not the only ones to have said that either. Discerning the relative contributions of the glycocalyx and intracellular junctions will undoubtedly prove to be challenging. Yes. Challenging, yes. yes that's right. And so I need much more money to do that, right? right. Yeah. You know. So here's the – I always like to look at the – um. Last sentence, um, these findings provide insight into the biology of NS1 and uh, support the inclusion of NS1 in flavivirus vaccine development. That would be interesting, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I wonder if, uh, so that would not block infection. It would per block se. a lot of the pathogenesis, maybe. That's and right. maybe it would prevent the virus from getting into tissues where it replicates the high level. Right. So maybe. Yeah. Could be. Could be effective. Could be. Interesting. What a scary protein. Yeah, <laughs> and this protein, the three-dimensional structure, has been solved. So you can, and in fact, that's what they use in their in their little diagrams. They actually have shrunk the three-dimensional structures down. Hmm. It's a hexamer. Six copies, Dixon. I know what that meant. Yep. <laughs> Dick, uh, Rich, you were going to say something. Uh, no. I'm done. He was just laughing say at anything. you saying a scary protein. Uh, yeah, that's it what is, it is. So they call it, they call it a virulence factor. Yeah. And so it, I think it is. There are not a lot of, That's right. of virus virulence factors, you know, but this is, a, this is clearly yeah. one, right? Yes. Now, could you make a vaccine by mucking with NS1? Maybe. Or Maybe. An, are antibodies made during the natural course of the infection? To NS1, yeah, yeah, they are. You'd have to okay. figure out how to deliver it as an antigen without yes. inducing vascular yes. itself. <laughs> well i'm thinking i'm thinking right, another right, way right. if you uh, uh uh is an ns1 negative virus if you remove ns1 does the virus dead. it's dead okay it's dead is a doornail mm. or doorknob what, uh, how does this doornail. what i was doornail. asking doornail a doornail Door what is a doornail it's anyway? A, I, th- I think of it as the bolt dead. that goes in the hinge, right? That holds the the hinge. Okay. Together. Oh, I thought of it. I thought so, it was a nail holding the um, uh, the door <laughs> threshold or door jam I'll in place. <laughs> but why is it saying at all that is a doornail? Because any nail is dead, right? All these sayings. I have... think we should say dead is a virus. It says yeah. a doornail is a stud set in a door for strength or as an ornament. Really, hmm. but uh, Brianne, you could identify the parts of NS1 that were 
important for vascular leakage. I bet there's a specific part. Right, certainly. Maybe that binds the glycocalyx and then take it out or, or alter it, and that might give you immunogenicity without the, the vascular leakage, et cetera. Hopefully, right? yeah. Although they do say here, when they're talking about this wing domain, they do say that this area of NS1 is immunodominant in mice and humans. Mm. Yeah, that that was what I wondered, is whether that same area would also uh, yeah. be the, the most <laughs> antigenic. So you take it out so it doesn't cause leak, but then <laughs> they know it the antibody. Yeah, exactly. But Although when you take it out, you might get other areas stepping up to be immunodominant, right? Step forward, like when the star player gets injured, you know. Right. Other people sometimes utility still, infielder steps. In. And incidentally, yeah. I ju- just looked up the etymology of "dead as a doornail," and it's <laughs> it's questionable, but it's a very very old usage <laughs> uh, when doors were held together with the hand forged nails, and apparently um, it was common practice to pound the nail through to hold the boards together, and then um, bend the end of the nail over so that it wouldn't come out. Uh, which means that it becomes it's dead. permanently in, in there and it is dead as a doornail. Right. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, that's when you made doors out of planks, Yes, right? I think so. Hmm. They're still the best looking doors, the plank oh. doors. Yeah. Right? They just, the, the hollow ones just don't cut it. You know, hollow right. core doors. Yeah. I know them well. All right. Let's, um, anything else before we move on? Dixon, do you have any additional comments? No, I just love the paper choice. Thank you. Anything with Flavi in it, you love, right? Well, I seem to be attracted to that group. Yeah. The first TWIV was? The very yes. first one. That's West right. Nile. <laughs> West Nile. It started yeah. it, right? So you got me hooked. <laughs> you got me hooked. All right. Um, let's do some emails. We have uh, we have a Jens email, Jens Kuhn. And uh, I knew he would write after we discussed <laughs> Ebola and classification. Dear Twiv team, just so catching buckle up. up on this Twitter is going to take a little while. <laughs> now listening to recurring threads, two comments. One, Makona versus Ebola. Maybe the following opposition helps. So we have, on the one hand, family Canidae, genus Canis, species Canis familiaris, animal dog, breed Siberian husky, individual spot. <laughs> I really like <laughs> I that. love it. Yeah. So then we have family Filoviridae, genus Ebola virus, species Zaire Ebola virus, animal, <laughs> in this case, virus, Ebola virus, variant Makona, isolate CO5. So the variant is like the breed. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so CO5 is spot. We'll just yes, pull Ebola spot. CO5 spot from there. Yeah. On. By the way, Mayinga is an isolate name of the Yambuku variant of Ebola virus. Okay. One, species versus things. What a species is has not been decided, and even Darwin carefully shied away from defining it. However, notably, he had no problem describing and defining animals, which are members of the species. I attached two fun papers for you to read about the issue. You will see that many people in zoology and botany also consider species concepts rather than real things, and many oppose that (laughs) view. The way I see it, a species is what you see when you close your eyes and you see Tyrannosaurus rex. The ideal form. The yeah, image yeah. comes from all the knowledge, right or wrong, you have about all the individual animal specimens that are very, very closely related, and this knowledge is meshed together as some kind of an average. For instance, many museum dinosaur skeletons are mosaics of bones found at different right. places. Mm-hmm. They don't actually truly represent a single animal. Likewise, there may be deductions on muscle mass from currently living reptiles and artists' rendering of skin color, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Obviously, the T-Rex in your imagination does not exist and also never existed. Hence, species are not things idea. Translated to modern times, even if you sequence one million human genomes, you will not know all the different variations that are permitted in a human genome to still result in a human. Hence, even one million genomes are only an approximation of what a genome is and by extrapolation what a human is. Even if you sequence everybody living, you would have no idea about the traits of those who have lived or those who will live. Thus, the species Homo sapiens is, again, that image in your mind of what a human is based on all the averaged, overlaid knowledge we have on actual (coughs) individual humans that one can actually study. One more. Imagine you find a single skeleton of a novel prehistoric primate, and that primate has a cleft palate. If you base your species definition solely on this one skeleton, then the species definition would be must have a cleft palate. However, maybe the 
cleft palate is an aberration, which you will only know if you sample more and more specimens and adjust your species definition accordingly with every new found data point. Likely the species definition will change to mostly does not, but may have <laughs> cleft palates. <laughs> that again clarifies that a species cannot be studied as it is a concept constantly influxed. Last and best one. If I ask you to imagine the species Homo sapiens and you see a man in your mind, then you are sexist, even if the very man you think about actually exists. The species is more than I just I can't males. do anything right. Just, again, emphasizing that averaging point I made above the human species is both male and female and everything in between at the same time, and hence can hardly be studied. But again, that is just how I wrap my head around all this. But let's also see the attached article I wrote many moons ago on this subject which contains this wonderful quote from Richard Dawkins. Quote, the rabbits that we see are wan shadows of the perfect idea of rabbit, the idea essential platonic rabbit hanging somewhere out in conceptual space. Flesh and blood rabbits may vary, but their variations are always to be seen as flawed deviations from the ideal essence of rabbit. End quote. That ideal essence is the species Orctolagus cuniculus. Mm. Best Jens P.S. The plural of taxon is taxa. Exactly. That's good. I like that. Thank you, Jens. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so there's this, there's an essay. I'm sure he's aware of this, but uh, I use it a lot in my teaching when I teach ecology. It's a guy by the name of G. Evelyn Hutchinson who defined the uh, essential niche for a species and uh, mathematically proved that the same niche cannot be occupied by two separate species. How would he know that? And the answer is he can't. Because he can't define a species. But, that's, but that's, his mathematics defines a niche. No, but there are sympatric species, right? That and allopatric occup species. That, that occupy the same space, so that's not a definition. No, 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 no. You're not getting the point. They can't occupy the same niche. The niche is defined by many different parameters. Yeah, well, it's not just a space thing. Often we don't know the niche then. It's like, we don't. This yeah. is exactly yeah, right. I, I you should read his – he gave this as an after-dinner speech – at a meeting of ecologists, and I can't believe that anybody was awake at the end of it because it had so much complicated mathematics. It's only about four pages long, and I give it as a reading assignment to my students, and no one comes back with a clear view of what he actually meant. Mm. And I had the privilege of actually meeting him when I was in graduate school at Notre Dame. So I, I didn't think enough to ask him, could you simplify <laughs> your definition of a niche so that I can go forward with this in my mind? And the answer is, it's not a simple concept, so you can't say And you certainly it. shouldn't so, give that as an after-dinner speech. No. No, you should not. You know the, you know a, the essay? No. Even? It's called Concluding Remarks, and it's just, it's it's impenetrable. It's like, it's <laughs> thicker than a glycocalyx. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's, you know, the first page is just English, and you're reading it, and you're, 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 you just, you just want to turn the page. It's so eloquently written. The next page is just all math formula. We did a uh, a paper on Tuivo this week where um, orchid bees. Oh, yeah. The male bees make a perfume from orchids, and that's how they find the right uh, species, species to mate with, right? Because the female will smell. If it's the wrong perfume, then they, they go away. Yeah. And that is based on olfactory receptors. Mm -hmm. And that's that controls the speciation of that. It's very interesting. Yeah. All right, uh, Brianne, can you take one, please? Sure. Gia writes, hearing gems like this conversation with Dr. Rucker in TWIV 529 is what makes this series of podcasts such a treasure. I can't think of any more powerful inspiration for the next generation than to hear the pure joy for lifelong learning that emanating that emanated from such a modest, accomplished scientist. As always, thanks for making all of this possible. P.S. 9 Celsius and a cloudless sunny day in Los Angeles with a hint of winter in the air. <laughs> <laughs> never, never in L.A. Well, wow. it's only a hint. <laughs> it only depends a hint. on how you define winter, you know. Right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And, and Rich, and uh, can you take the last Olga two? Olga writes, very nice and interesting to listen to such a great scientist in person. I was a student at Madison from 1974 to 1978 and had virology classes by mm. him. That's, once again, about Roland Rickert. This was a great episode. Uh, cool guy. It, it, yeah. Everybody likes Roland. You never hear anything anybody say anything <laughs> bad about Roland. It's really great. Everyone likes yeah. Nixon, yeah. too. That's right. Laura Nobody says anything bad about you. Except, well, no. Except me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I don't take it serious, so it doesn't matter. You better. I don't. 
I'm sorry. Lorna writes, this interview was absolutely inspiring. I enjoyed it very much. Please pass along to Roland Rickert a very heartfelt hello, and I am proud to be associated with you through family. <laughs> Lorna from uh, Costco, Wisconsin. Yeah, there are a couple of comments on the website, which I thought were cool. Hmm. I wonder how people find, I mean, she took classes with him in 1974. How did she find this? It's cool, yeah. right? Cool. I like that. All right, let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us? I have um, something that I learned about from one of my students earlier this week. Uh, he came to my office and wanted to know my opinion on it. And since I'd never heard of it, <laughs> I didn't have an opinion at that particular moment. Um, but this is actually a study that's being done at St. Louis University um, where they have taken a hotel on campus and uh, – set it up to be hotel influenza where patients can be um, infected or given a, a flu vaccine and then experimentally infected with flu and can stay there for about 10 days um, and have their full flu course studied. Um, and patients are getting, or participants are getting paid quite a bit to, for their travel and uh, everything else in coming to be uh, studied with, for their influenza response. $3,500. Mm. $3,500. I think nice. it's yeah. terrific. I really, you know, yeah. if you really want to do the experiment, this is it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm I not going to check in, though. No. No, but, you know, 10 days, free <laughs> Wi Fi. No one checks out. <laughs> <laughs> and and they do have they have they have nursing coverage they're on you know they're on top of complications if they arise you're already in a hospital type facility and so probably nobody's going to die um <laughs> yeah, that's an endorsement yeah. <laughs> i like that <laughs> so there's one there's a, a there's a company in the uk that does similar things and we've talked about it before they they actually are a company who will do this on contract for whoever's interested in testing an antiviral or a vaccine. Mm. And again, they use flu because you can vaccinate people right. and right. protect them. And there was a, a polio vaccine trial done in the UK, I believe, where they set up a temporary hotel polio, <laughs> <laughs> a series of shipping containers in a parking lot. Wow. And they housed people there and, and they called it um, the polio villa. Wow. I guess entomologists would have a similar thing for cockroaches called the Roach Motel. <laughs> yeah. Check in, but don't check. Yeah. 3500 is what they pay you? Yes. Is that what you yes. said? Yes, 3500 is what they pay you. So, That's a so, lot. So, Brianne, would days. you do this? Would you do this, Brianne? Um, only when I'm very stressed and I'm looking forward to 10 days off. <laughs> <laughs> would you do it, Dixon? No. How about you? Yeah, I do it. You know, I used to like uh, 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 much the same as Brienne. I used to like going to the dentist. Believe it or not, yeah, what? because Come no, on. this is true. Richard, I don't like going true. to the dentist. Well, no, I like going to the dentist <laughs> because uh, I knew there was nothing I could do about it. I was in somebody else's hands for this period of time, <laughs> and all of the other obligations were off the table. Okay, this is it. Would you just sleep while they operated? Uh, you or something? know, just kind of spaced out. You know, so I could. Uh, you know, yeah, I could do this. I'd be interested in this. Yeah, you know. I'd even be interested if I got uh, sick. You know, I'd want to. I'd want to see all the data. Uh, yeah, but we're getting older, Rich. The, oh, I can handle it. Doesn't um, work as yeah, I, Oh yeah. Oh really? Oh yeah. Uh, Alan, Alan, would you no. do this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't want to deliberately get infected with flu. I wholeheartedly support that this exists and it's great for science, but uh, it's not for me. All right. It's too long a time. Alan, what do you have for I us? I have a website. Uh, this is this has gotten a fair amount of coverage lately as well. It should, but it's just a really cool use of, uh, of mapping and data. Um, you put in, it's got a map of the U S displayed. Um, I, don't know if it covers Canada. It does not seem to cover Mexico because I looked at that. It's got Vancouver and Calgary in it. Okay, so it's got it's got major Some, Canadian least, cities. Yeah. Um, so you put in, you, you select a city or you click the map, you type in your city, and it will tell you what town it'll it'll essentially identify your sister city. What town your city will most feel like in sixty years time. <laughs> So, so Brisbane and Cairns are yes, going to rise. Well, yeah. right. So, <laughs> so I put in I put in Springfield, Massachusetts, and I got a town in southern Missouri that's several degrees right. warmer and a good bit wetter. Um, 
And uh, depending, you know, if you go further south, I put in Baltimore and I got some, you know, someplace much deep down in Mississippi, I think. Um, and this, of course, is because we're changing the climate and uh, this is what it's going to feel like. And you can choose. Do you want the business as usual high emissions scenario or do you want a reduced emissions um you know, like we actually put in an effort to cut back on fossil fuel use, then what it would what would it be like? Looks like I'm lo- I, I'm moving cool. to Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if you, you if better you hurry, uh, they're building a wall. If you reduce emissions, it makes it makes a big, a big difference. difference. Yes. Uh, yeah, Alan, do you know what the size of the dots is? Um, I they're correlating with uh, population. I think. Okay. Mm. Yeah, it's population. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Rich, Rich, what do you have? Okay, so this has been in the news, but I have to do this. Uh, The uh, (laughs) NASA's uh, Opportunity rover Mars mission uh, has come to an end. Um, So the Opportunity is one of uh, several rovers that have been robots, rovers that have been landed on uh, Mars. This one landed uh, 15 years ago. Uh, with a mission that they figured would last uh, 90 days and go uh, a kilometer. And it lasted 15 years and has done a marathon. It went 28 miles. Hmm. Um, And so it, uh, and and most importantly, achieved its most important goal, which was looking to see if there was ever a lot of water, in particular surface water on Mars. And it found uh, evidence that, yes, long ago, it was probably a very different looking planet with not only underground water, but also surface water and erosion and stuff that uh, goes with that. Um, so I thought this was cool. And I, the, the article here is from the jet propulsion laboratory. There are several around. I like fairly primary, uh, resources and it's, it's a nice article, but also has a, um, an, uh, a couple of videos in it, um, that, uh, describe the mission and its ending. Actually, this, what stopped it was a dust storm that happened about eight months yeah. ago that enveloped the entire mm. planet. And there are there are pictures of this where you can you know see uh, pictures mm. of Mars and the surface is just completely obscured with a dust storm. So it was uh, quite an event. I, its oh, final message translated roughly to "My battery is low and it's getting dark." <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, yeah. You know, they. Uh, it's just, it's so so just it so poignant, and it it ended in a place that they've named Perseverance Valley. Yeah, they <laughs> and, and, and interestingly, uh, in the minds of the um, scientists, uh, the rover, much the same as a ship, has a gender. It's female. Yes. Uh, and I want to point out also uh, that this is. Um, this is the one I added another link here to an animation of the landing. This is one, the one of maybe the only mm, one yeah. where they landed it by uh, inflating a whole bunch of balloons around it. Okay. And at the very last right. stages, yeah. it bounced along and then deflated yeah. the yeah. balloons and righted itself and went off. They before and since they've gone to a powered descent. Um, right. But that, right. But I thought that one was pretty cool. At any rate, so long opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. Still there, oh, yeah. Right? And they played a they played a very sad song by Billy Holiday. Ah, uh, yes. To say right. goodbye to it yeah. after he. So it, why uh, couldn't the, the battery recharge when the sun? Because it's covered came in out? dust and it's yeah. worn out. It's uh, well, it'll be interesting, you know. So maybe, what, maybe, we'll go to Mars eventually, and presumably uh, at some point they'll come across yeah. these uh, old yeah. things, and maybe if you dusted it off, it'd power up again. Yeah. Anyway, well, could, well, it, could well, the wind come up? Did you see the movie The dust? Martian? Yeah. 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 No, I read yeah he the goes book, and he though. digs up the, the rover and yeah. uses it as a, yeah, as a that's communication right. terminal. Yeah. <laughs> spare parts. Spare parts. It, it was very right, useful exactly. for him. Yes. Hmm. Cool. That's very neat. <laughs> It comes to an end. So there are other rovers. Uh, yeah, and there's, uh, and there's a. One other. And then there's the size of Mars is a planet populated entirely by robots. There's a. Should we send some rovers to Australia? Uh, we got to send some <laughs> rovers to Washington. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, there's um, uh, another, uh, one of the videos, I think it may be linked in here. Yes, I think it's in this article, uh, is a, a short video about an up- upcoming expedition. They're going to launch in 2020. 
uh, and yes. this uh, shot from the JPL labs and they're, uh, where they're assembling the vehicle and the rover that they're going to shoot up for this one. It has big wheels to fill. It's a, it's a big, very large. Mm. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. I'm sure we'll hear oh, from yeah. you about it, Rich, yeah. right? Nice. Right. Dixon de Pommier. Yes, sir. Um, this is a photo contest sponsored by Biomed Central, which I had never <clears> heard of before. And I'm glad I ran across it because they posted the winning images. And, um, well, it's, of course, the science images. The image that was absolutely stunning was the mouse brain. Mouse kidney. Hmm. I'm saying kidney. It's exactly right. Sometimes they, they did the, the brain, thing, too. Right? No, they, <laughs> they, did the, they did the brain, too. But they did the kidney, and they, they colorized it according to the functionality of the region of the kidney being shown. And it's a stunning picture. It's just – and. And they reckon they can do this with human tissues as well. Neat. Mm. And then there are lots of other images that I, I put in there. These are great. But, uh, I think, like 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 that paper that we did today, you know, if you can see it, yeah. then it's really absolutely tactile. I mean, you can feel mm-hmm. the images almost, right? And that's that's why I think these uh, deserve uh, publication. EMC is a public. Yes. It's part of yep. nature, Springer Nature. Actually, I found... Maybe, uh, a lot of the I found it interesting that uh, one of these that's sort of very different than all the others, but in some ways is the most appealing, is this group of kids looking at a microchip. Yes, yes, uh, I that was really cool. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's Curiosity yeah. Rover yeah. <laughs> times twenty. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah, good stuff. All right, uh, I have a cool video. It's a time lapse video of a um, salamander. Yes. From a single cell developing ah. into a tadpole. And mm-hmm. it's like uh, mm-hmm. six minutes of video from three weeks. It's so cool. You see all the cells initially dividing, and then it begins to fold. And right. then it's it's just beautiful. It's really nicely it's really photographed, cool. too. Mm-hmm. You can just um, watch yeah, it Yeah, I like right? this. It's amazing. And I'm just thinking of all those genes going on and off in there. And the chemical trails. Promoters. That's right. I kind of liked I kind of so liked cool. gastrulation. I got into gastrulation yes. when I was uh, <laughs> when I was in college, and see that happening is cool. <laughs> I'm watching it. You can see all these yeah. cells moving around yeah. beneath the surface. Very cool. And uh, okay, so that's pretty cool. That and I like the the very end. He just swims off, and he got a blank screen. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for another day. We have an, a listener pick from Anne. Who writes, please share this Kickstarter project for an updated edition of the board game Pathogenesis. I'm pretty sure I heard about the game on one of your podcasts. The second edition has now been listed on Kickstarter. I imagine many of your listeners might be interested in having the game or updating their first edition versions with the STD <laughs> expansion <laughs> kit. Yeah, st- you want to get a sexually like transmitted it disease? Yeah. That yeah. Right? Yeah, STD, you do. yes. Yep. I don't know how long Kickstarter has run, so getting the word out quickly to help bring the second edition to life would no doubt be helpful. It's probably done already, the uh, way these, if it's these things not. Are, it actually just opened almost. earlier this week um, and is going until March 14th. Uh, it's got it's got 24000 of its $29,000 goal. Uh, doing so, pretty well. Yeah. Wow. Uh-huh. With it, with it, with uh, 26 days to go, it's it's doing just fine. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not affiliated with the project. I just think it's a great idea to help students learn the complex subject of immunology, including me. And and includes a link of, of a game review at JAMA. Regards from a loyal listener who appreciates all that you and your teams do to bring more science to the masses. Uh-huh. Thank you. That is TWIV535. You can find it wherever fine podcasts are distributed. <laughs> And wherever free podcasts are distributed, mm-hmm. and uh, will always be free and without restrictions, we will not be gobbled we'll up. Will be by, free and in the wild. Gobbled up by commerciality. What's that company that just bought the podcast? Amazon. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you do listen, please subscribe so we we can tell how many people are listening. And uh, if you like what we do, please consider supporting us financially. You go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You could give a buck a month. It would really help out. 
And of course, questions and comments to Twiv at microbe.tv. Dixon de Pommier can be found at parasiteswithoutborders.com and trichinella.org. He has many, many other websites too. That's your fault. Thank you, Dixon. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a good class. I had a great class. All right. Yeah, we discussed creating an entire city for 100,000 people made out of a mass timber. Made out of popcorn. Mass timber. What is, what's mass timber? It's, a, it's called ply scrapers. They're, they're made out of wood. They're, the, they've created a new building material out of wood that's stronger than steel. There's a guy here who's working with a company who they make bricks, building bricks out of fungus. Yes. Yeah. You add water. I've seen that too. And you put it in a mold and it makes a bloody brick and you build the building with it. I've seen seen that too. Amazing. Yeah. But this is a way for an entire city to sequester carbon rather than get it off. Neat. So they're buying into this. So building out of wood is a new innovative thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. Yeah, well, this it's, kind yes, of wood, I, no, yes, I get it. I get not, it. It's an engineered, it's an engineered wood around. product. It's, yeah. We do. We do. We if around. you want to see a good example, there's one in Minneapolis. It's an office building. And you just type out a uh, wood office building, Minneapolis, you'll get it. Hmm. It's, it's a beautiful feeling when you walk into it, too. It's like you're going into a yacht cool. or something. You see this beautiful, well done wood. Brianne Barker's at Drew University. She's on Twitter as Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Thanks. Brianne. It was really great to be here. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove's at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. We've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.